Thanks for that introduction, JP. Good morning to everyone, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I'll just start by saying that if you'd asked me, if you told me 10 years ago that I'd be standing up here and talking about obesity and metabolic disturbances in children with mental illness, I would have told you that you're insane. This hadn't really been on my radar when I started my career in 2003, and in fact, my training was in type 1 diabetes. And then a couple of years into my um, uh, staff job at BC Children's, I started to get calls from all over the province because at BC Children's we serve the entire province of one million children. And um, kids with mental illness were being put on these uh, certain types of medications called second generation antipsychotic medications. And this was resulting in new onset uh, diabetic ketoacidosis or type 2 diabetes. And I was being called uh, to ask what to do about this and had I seen this before. And then at 2 in the morning I ran into the now head of Department of Psychiatry and I asked her had she seen this kind of thing. We were starting to see this. And she said, you know, in fact, I'm starting to see kids back um, a year later from our acute psychiatric unit and I don't even recognize them because some of them have gained 50 pounds. And so I think, yeah, I think this is a problem and it's under-recognized in kids, hence leading to a journey for me of a research program since about 2007. And so what I hope for you today will be to help you make some connections and raise awareness to help find some solutions for this problem. Um, this is my disclosure slide. I have no disclosures. In fact, I always say that the uh, pharmaceutical companies would pay me not to talk about some of the medication-related uh, side effects. Uh, so I hope today to start to help you gain an appreciation for the complex interrelationship between certain features of mental health conditions, chronic stress, genetic factors, lifestyle issues and medications, and their relationship with obesity and metabolic dysfunction in youth. And uh, to show you some of the literature um, that has evolved over the last few years related to obesity and metabolic dysfunction related to psychotropic agents in children. So um, when I started in this area, I was uh, surprised to find out that 15% of youth and 20% of adults will suffer from mental illness at any one point in their lifetime. And many will undergo a combination of both non-pharmacologic and pharmacological therapy. And some of the ones that we'll be discussing today include um, second generation antipsychotics, uh, antidepressants, and mood stabilizers. This is a diagram that slowly evolves uh, that I've sort of been working on since 2011 because what started out for me as the relationship between psychiatric conditions and medication side effects has turned out to be more complicated. And so I'd like to touch on all of these factors on the right and their relationship with obesity, insulin resistance, and some of the downstream effects. And ultimately, why do we care about all this? Well, we know that there's an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and mortality it's independent of the, you know, increased death from suicide in people with mental illness. Um, and really, there's very good literature showing that adults with severe mental illness like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and major depressive disorder have a reduced life expectancy compared to the general population. And in fact, that mortality due to myocardial infarction has been published to be 19% greater among persons with mental illness and 34% greater in individuals with schizophrenia compared to control populations. And this translates to 15 to 25 years of reduced life expectancy secondary to the combined effect of the burden of mental illness and the side effects from the medication. While, we're, while we don't know what the burden is in children, we would anticipate that it would be at least the same, if not more, since the mental illness is starting at a much younger age. So this concept of psychiatric conditions and obesity, metabolic disturbances, um, begs the question, you know, what comes first? And I think um, while I'm going to focus on the arrow of mental illness going towards obesity, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that it's been known for some time that obesity influences psychological distress and mental illness. And I just tried to highlight a few studies. Um, uh, in, in adults, uh, obesity is associated with a 25% increased odds of developing mood and anxiety disorders. Uh, there was a great study by Dr. Vogler's group um, where he looked at Canadian children and found that the odds of developing low self-esteem four years later were um, was significantly higher in those who were obese at baseline compared to those who were normal weight at baseline. And similar studies have been done in Hispanic and non-Hispanic white females. Um, Obese female adolescents become adults, uh, obese uh, female adults who earn lower wages, have an increased risk of living in poverty, and obese male adolescents are less likely to marry as adults. 
and uh, Dr. Jarrell used administrative data from South Carolina to show that pre-existing obesity in childhood was an independent predictor of adolescent onset bipolar disorder. And as well, chronic obesity has been associated with many other mental health conditions. A study shows its association with oppositional defiant disorder in both sexes and depressive disorders in boys. Well, what about the opposite direction, mental illness influencing obesity? Again, a lot of studies in adults, this one is showing that people with living with schizophrenia or bipolar illness have a twofold, at least, increased odds of obesity. Um, this study by Goodman uh, looked at children with a normal baseline BMI having depressed mood at baseline independently predicted obesity at one year follow up. And uh, Pine showed that childhood depression was associated with an increased BMI even into adulthood. There's been a lot of press related to the association between ADHD symptoms and overweight and obesity in adolescent girls. And again, Dr. Jarrell has shown that adolescents with bipolar disorder have had have an increased odds of not only obesity, but also type 2 diabetes compared to, to, con, to control youth. Um, this uh, image here, again, complex, um, shows the influence of mental illness on diabetes risk taken primarily from adult studies because we have less data in kids and type 2 diabetes. But what it's meant to highlight not only is the complex relationship, but there's at least four mental health conditions that influence uh, diabetes risk with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Um, having independent risk, but also um, two other conditions, generalized anxiety disorder and eating disorders, um, having high comorbidity with major depression, uh, having a reciprocal susceptibility to diabetes. And I'll just show you the study to support that. So this was a meta-analysis published in Diabetes Care in 2008 by Metzak and colleagues asking the question, does baseline depression predict incident type 2 diabetes? And you can see that um, their conclusion based on the, the pooled analysis was that, in fact, depression was associated with a staggering 60% increased risk of type 2 diabetes. This would be consistent with literature sh um, equivalent to smoking showing uh, a similar increased risk for type 2 diabetes. When we looked at the opposite question, does baseline type 2 diabetes predict incident depression? In fact, um, they did find a, only a modest increased risk of depression. So some food for thought. How about the role of chronic stress and mental illness to promote metabolic dysfunction? Well, we know that mental illness in childhood, and I'm sure mental illness in our adult, is associated with many early life uh, traumatic events hostile social environment. And this chronic stress has been shown uh, during a critical uh, time in the development of the neuroendocrine status to cause hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis dysregulation. And what's been shown in some um, conditions is that you get CRH overactivation, ACTH overactivation, and ultimately excess cortisol production with a loss of the regulatory feedback. And excess cortisol has been shown to impact many systems, not only the immune system in a negative way, but it's been associated with increased abdominal adiposity, increased insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, uh, diabetes, um, and other features of the metabolic syndrome. So again, a factor that um, needs to be considered when you're managing the patient. And there's certainly evidence for chronic stress and depression, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. What about other lifestyle factors that one needs to keep in mind? Well, children with mental illness are not above the, um, you know, have the same risks as other children related to um, things that Dr. Dietz talked about. So extra screen time and physical inactivity. I'll bring up sleep disturbances. I've got a couple of slides on the first two. I'm not going to really talk about sugar sweetened beverage consumption um, because uh, I, because there's, I don't I haven't been able to find any specific literature with children with mental illness, but certainly from our own experience in our provincial mental health metabolic program, these children are consuming just as much as other children I see in other um, in my t regular type two diabetes clinic. And in fact, some of the medications like the second generation antipsychotics I'll be talking about seem to cause excess carbohydrate craving and even more consumption. And again, smoking is an independent risk factor that we see morbidly with mental illness in kids. So this is a study published by one of my colleagues, a psychiatrist at BC Children's, where she looked at um, uh, excess, she looked at screen time in a population of, um, in a school setting as well as a uh, population in a psychiatric outpatient clinic, and she surveyed both parents and children asking them about the amount of uh, different electronic media. And what you can see here is that both groups had a total amount of screen time that was in excess of our recommendations, which would be less than two hours a day. 
on average, the kids in the school setting were doing about four and a half hours a day, but the kids in the psychiatric clinic were on average having two excess hours above the kids without mental illness a day. And what was most concerning was that their screen time involved some very violent video games and very mature related content, so something else that needs to be targeted. Um, I don't need to enforce why we're concerned about screen time. Certainly there's good studies to show that the more hours of TV you have a day, the increased relative risk of obesity. I think sleep is underappreciated, and I'm pleased to see that the next talk will be all about sleep. Sleep disturbances are highly prevalent in many mental health conditions in children, and I've tried to find some literature here for you uh, supporting their um, association in autism spectrum disorders, mood disorders, bipolar disorder, ADHD, anxiety disorders, and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And um, there's, I think it's an area of newly emerging research. Dr. McCrindle's group published this article in CMHA showing that in healthy adolescents, higher sleep disturbance scores were associated with increased cardiovascular risk scores, hypertension, and elevated non-HDL cholesterol. And we know from other work in adults, shift workers who have disturbed sleep, that they again have increased central adiposity, uh, increased um, metabolic syndrome risk, also likely mediated through cortisol. So it's a complex thing requiring further study. Well, what's near and dear to my heart is these medication side effects. And I think these are uh, an under-recognized problem, so I'd like to raise some awareness today about some of them, and we'll touch on uh, three of the most common, commonly prescribed medications in kids with mental illness. Second generation or atypical antipsychotics, SGAs, include a whole host available in Canada that I've listed here. Risperidone and quetiapine are the two most commonly prescribed agents in British Columbia. They've gained popularity since they were released in the early 1980s because of the fact that they have very specific 5-HT HT2A blockade and dopamine 2 blockade, uh, resulting in decreased extrapyramidal symptoms, so things like tardive dyskine dyskinesia, akathisia, and um, muscular rigidity. Um, while they've gained popularity, it's become clear, uh, certainly from the adult literature, that they're, they have a whole host of metabolic side effects in obesity. And in fact, this led um, to a, a joint statement by the American Psychiatric Association and the American Diabetes Association back in 2004, um, saying that adults who go on these medications need to be ca carefully monitored for these side effects. This came... Um, and certainly they've gained popularity for use in children and adolescents. Why are we concerned about that? Well, in Canada, uh, these medications have not been approved by Health Canada for use with the exception of aripiprazole in 15 to 17 year olds for schizophrenia. Um, every other prescription in Canada is off-label and even in the U.S., um, the FDA has only really approved them for four uh, very specific indications. Um, in, in the U.S., you can see that they're uh, their, their use has exponentially increased over the last um, 10 years. So there's been a six-fold increase. And this is data that we were allowed access to by the BC government because they recognized that SGAs were being um, increasingly prescribed not only to children but also to adults. There's some 90,000 adults who are on these medications in this province. And there's about 5,600 kids who are on, on these medications in British Columbia. And many of them are on for indications, primarily depression, for which there is really no evidence to support their use. And in fact, the only studies have shown no effect. Speaking to the positive impact of pharmaceutical companies and marketing to individual physicians to promote their use um, for these reasons. So we sought to look at this question initially back in uh, 2007 when um, I started getting these calls, and, we, and the head of psychiatry and I decided to look at this by doing a chart art of all the admissions to the CAPE unit, the Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Emergency Unit, which takes admissions from all over the province. So over about, from 2005 to 2007, we'd had 450 admissions. We audited all the charts to, to collect data on height and weight and to look for some metabolic monitoring parameters, particularly glucose, since there had been these 2004 guidelines promoting metabolic monitoring although none specifically in kids. And we looked cross-sectionally um, at one point in time on admission, and we categorized the kids as were they being SGA, treated on an SGA when they were admitted, or had they never been exposed to an SGA? And what was concerning to us is whereas the prevalence of overweight and obesity um, in the SGA-naive group was 23%, consistent with the stats for prevalence of overweight and obesity for Canadian children at large, in fact, uh, the prevalence in the SGA-treated kids was two and a half times higher. What was also 
concerning was that while the prevalence of impaired glucose tolerance and type 2 diabetes in the SG naive kids was 7.5%, which is consistent with two large US-based uh, screening studies showing the prevalence of impaired uh, fasting glucose being at about 7%, the, the prevalence was about three times higher um, in the SGA treated group. Now, this paper made the front page of the Vancouver Sun, not, be, I think, because of these results, but because they picked up on the fact that there, when we actually audited these 450 charts, and you probably picked up on this as well, the ends were a lot smaller than what I told you we originally looked at. And in fact, only about a third of these kids were even getting their height measured in a tertiary care institution to look at their body mass index. And very few of these kids were getting any sort of metabolic monitoring. Um, less than a third were getting or about a third were getting fasting glucose lipids, and you could only really calculate blood pressure norms in about 40% because you need height Z scores in order to do that in kids. And so that led to some quality assurance initiatives in our own institution to look more carefully and institute metabolic monitoring. Around the same time, Dr. Christoph Carell published in JAMA, where he, he looked at 272 kids uh, prospectively over about a 12-week period of time and followed them on different SGAs and looked at absolute weight gain over a period of 12 weeks with a mean study duration of 10.8 weeks. And he found staggering amounts of weight gain. I mean, you don't need to convert this to BMI to know that it's not normal for a child to gain 8.5 kilos over 12 weeks on olanzapine, 6 kilos on quetiapine, 5 kilos on risperidone, and 4 kilos on aripiprazole. And you can see that this weight gain starts very early, even within the first four weeks. Similarly, massive increases in waist circumference in a very short period of time, up to eight and a half centimeters on olanzapine and five centimeters on some of these other medications. And this was really important data because up until that point, for example, aripiprazole had been thought to be weight neutral in adults. And the reason for that is the studies had been done on people with schizophrenia that are, had already gained a massive amount of weight and then they were being put on aripiprazole and they weren't gaining any further weight and people were saying, oh, this medication is weight neutral. But when you give um, a naive child this medication for the first time, you can see that they're not immune to gaining weight. As I mentioned since then, now sorry, I should just say in Dr. Carell's study, he looked also at the transition to overweight and obesity over a very short period of time, 12 weeks. And you can see that overall, 17% of these kids had transitioned from a normal weight to overweight and obesity. And, and massive percentages of these kids, over 50% in almost every group, had gained more than 7% of their body weight in that short period of time. Again, very concerning. Now, his study was short, and so his uh, other risk factors like metabolic syndrome, the prevalence was quite low even after 12 weeks. As I mentioned, we then, we had instituted this other, this monitoring protocol in our hospital, and we looked at this in kids who had been treated for a longer duration of time. So this, this uh, study was published in Canadian Journal of Psychiatry last year, and we had prospectively consented all the admissions in CAPE after instituting this quality assurance protocol with measurements of waist circumference and blood work. We gathered data on 117 SGA treated kids and 217 SGA naive kids. And um, as I mentioned, they were treated for a median of 14 months, some of as long as seven years on these medications. Um, and you can see that the, the prevalence of metabolic syndrome was about 18%, which was 34-fold higher in the SJ-treated group compared to the SJ and naive group. And with the exception of uh, HDL cholesterol, which was no different between the two groups, you can see that there was significant differences in all of the other metabolic syndrome parameters. And I should say that in this impaired fasting glucose group included new cases of type 2 diabetes that were identified because of our proactive screening. They were otherwise asymptomatic walking around with type 2 diabetes. The other thing that struck us with this data was that not everyone gets the metabolic side effects um, from these medications, and why is that? Raising the question of the role of um, genetic polymorphisms as a mediator. And so I partnered with um, one of the basic scientists at our institute, Dr. Angela Devlin, and we decided to start looking at this. We had started collecting a DNA bank um, on these children and healthy controls. And one of the targets that she proposed looking at was the methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. C677T variant, because of its association for cardiovascular disease risk 
and features of metabolic syndrome in, in healthy adults without psychiatric illness. And in fact, when we looked at a separate cohort, we demonstrated that this variant, this T allele, was associated with a six-fold increased odds of metabolic um, syndrome risk in these SGA-treated children. Since then, Dr. Carell's group has published on another genetic polymorphism, MC4R, and um, we'll, we're also presenting data. Our postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Cote, will be presenting data tomorrow on FTO. So I think this, there's emerging evidence for a role for this, and um, it may, may lead to some personalized genomic, genomic medicine. So enough of SGAs, I could talk about them forever. I wanted to touch on SSRIs because um, these are also gaining a lot of popularity and commonly used in kids with depression and anxiety disorders. And in spite of the scares related to suicidality risk uh, with, one of, with one of the drugs, um, you can see that they're continuing. This is, again, BC Pharmacare data showing that they're their use is still on the rise. So, so what's what is the risk? Well, in adults, again, association studies, they ha their treatment in adults has been associated again with obesity, um, uh, hypercholesterolemia, hypertriglyceridemia, and increased risk for type two diabetes. But again, as I've shown you before, there's an independent relationship between depression and type two diabetes. So, interpreting these data is complicated. In fact, I would say that the jury is out for SSRIs and obesity and metabolic complications in children. There's really been very, in spite of all these prescriptions, there's no one's really looked at this at all. Um, there, I was really only able to find two studies, and the reason I looked is we're going to be starting our own research study at BC Children's. So there's just a short-term prospective study where they looked at weight gain over 19 weeks with fluoxetine or Prozac, and actually saw weight loss over that short period of time, significant weight loss. And then there was, there was a case report of four kids who, in fact, had decreased linear height growth secondary to growth hormone suppression during SSRI treatment, and two of them responded to growth hormone therapy. That's it for the literature on growth, and really there's no literature on metabolic dysfunction, and so we're going to be starting a prospective study in kids with generalized anxiety disorder and depression to follow them up for a year, look at their BMIs carefully, because it's not even common practice in psychiatry to measure kids' heights and weights uh, in this particular clinic, get the data, and then decide if, if there's a reason to look for metabolic dysfunction. Finally, mood stabilizers have um, been on my radar as well as a, as a risk for weight gain in children, particularly with bipolar. And Dr. Carell did a nice uh, systematic review of um, mood stabilizers a few years back now, looking at 19 short-term studies, including four, um, 24 medication trials and 684 patients. Uh, mood stabilizers include medications like lithium and valproate, uh, TPX is topiramate, and what he showed in this um, in this meta-analysis was that the highest weight gain over this uh, average duration of 15 weeks was, again, SGA plus a mood stabilizer, about five and a half kilos, followed second by SGAs. But you can see that mood stabilizers alone, especially when two mood stabilizers like lithium and valproic acid are used together, lead to significant weight gain, followed by a mood stabilizer excluding tapiramate. Tapiramate was the only mood stabilizer where significant weight loss was seen in two studies of some 34 patients. So I, I, just to summarize, I've taken you through a whirlwind tour. It's hard in 20 minutes to, um, to make anything too detailed, but I hope I've emphasized to you that there's a complex interrelationship between psychiatric illness and ob obesity and metabolic comorbidities in children modulated not only by the individual mental health condition, but there's a role for, for chronic stress, lifestyle risk factors like any child. There's a role for genetic polymorphisms and certainly psychotropic med medication side effects I think have been under-recognized and need to be looked at more carefully. And really, clinicians need to be aware of these health risks so that they can monitor and proactively counsel and treat their patients for these comorbidities to prevent the increased morbidity and mortality from both diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And I thought I would end with this um, slide, which is uh, we've been very fortunate to receive the funding from the Provincial Health Services Authority to develop our program, which I would say is unique in Canada and North America. And they've also provided us with money to develop a, a resource center web website. So it's keltymentalhealth.ca. It has great resources not just for mental health, but for healthy, active living. And we've partnered with um, both a, a family advocacy group and developed toolkits for families related to healthy, active living, where we specifically address the challenges for kids with mental health conditions and also a complementary toolkit for professionals on specific challenges and how to address them for kids with mental health concerns. They're freely downloadable PDFs and I encourage you to take a look at this website. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dina, for this uh, presentation on such an emerging problem here. I think we can really handle one or two short questions. Um, that's a really good question. We're working on that. So there is good data, for example, related to in schizophrenia, where these medications, the, the better you respond to the medication in terms of your positive and negative symptoms um, of the schizophrenia, the worse the metabolic side effects will be. And if you try, for example, to treat the dyslipidemia with something like Lipitor, you'll actually make the mental health condition worse and the delusions will come back. So that's adult data that actually has come out of um, UBC. Um, there's, I think there's, you know, serotonin is not just in the brain, it's also in places like the pancreas, and we have some data that we're just preparing for publication showing that one of these agents, quetiapine, seems to directly impact beta cells, and so you actually directly affect insulin secretion at the beta cell. We've shown this in uh, data in humans, and then I went to another basic scientist who's looked at islets and showed decreased um, insulin protein content and RNA expression in, in beta cells once they're exposed to quetiapine. I think it's complex. People haven't looked at it. Like I said, it hasn't. It's it's starting it's becoming on people's radar, but more work needs to be done on it. Hello. Um, I'm just wondering if you can clarify the um, SGA, um, the situation with the newest SGAs. I think that you were talking about Abilify in particular, saying that all the marketing is telling us that. They're not going to gain weight, but based on the structure of the studies, in fact, the people had already gained the weight. Is that the same for all the new newer SGAs? It seems to be the case. I mean, Dr. Carell has done the most work, and I was recently at the American Academy of Child Medicine Psychiatry, and he's showing the same data that that all the new SGAs coming out are, are causing varying degrees of weight gain and metabolic dysfunction. Uh, we're seeing that with Abilify. We're seeing that with Ciprazidone. Um, we're seeing that with Paliperidone. And in fact, I mean, I've, you know, Abilify wasn't supposed to cause glucose intolerance, and I've had several new cases of type 2 diabetes and impaired glucose tolerance with Abilify. And people are using this as their, you know, their... New, new favorite drug. I mean, it does have some benefits. Prolactin doesn't go up as, with Abilify like it does with Risperidone, but then you're still getting some of the other concerning adverse metabolic effects. And I didn't really touch on prolactin and some of the other stuff because I just didn't have time today. I think we will have to, to stop and maybe you could uh, contact Dina just after the, 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 the presentation. Thank you again, Dina.